Welcome to the ABA program, Demystifying the Judicial Clerkship Process and Experience. The event today is being co-sponsored by the ABA Law Student Division and the ABA National Conference of Federal Trial Judges. My name is Josephine Bond and I will be serving as your moderator today. Joining me on the program and serving as faculty, faculty today includes Judge Leo Brisboy, Judge Barbara Lynn, and Judge Margaret Seymour. During this session, the faculty will be sharing invaluable insights into what the clerkship application process entails, how to stand out amongst the very large number of people applying for these positions, what application and interview pitfalls to avoid, how to prepare for your clerkship, the qualities of successful clerks that these judges have had before, and what clerkship and internship opportunities are currently available. Before we start the program with some introductions, I would like to give you some housekeeping information. First, this program is currently being recorded and will be available afterwards and is available for free to all ABA members. Second, time permitting, we will have a live Q&A session during the near end of the program. You may submit questions anytime during the program using the questions function in the webinar interface. Austin has provided details for you in the chat uh, section right now. As a final reminder, there's handouts including the faculty bios and information about clerkship and internship opportunities included in the handout section on the right side of your screen. Now let's start the program off with some introductions by the faculty. Judge, Judge Brid Brisboy, can you start us off? Yes, I can. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you joining us. Uh, my name is Leo Brisboy. I'm a United States Magistrate Judge for the District of Minnesota. Uh, the Minnesota is one single district and we have eight full-time magistrate judges and seven uh, current active district court judges. We have courthouses in St. Paul, Minneapolis, uh, and Duluth, and I am chambered in Duluth. The, uh, my, I've been on the bench since August of 2010. Uh, prior to that, I was in private practice. Uh, as a litigation, civil litigation attorney, uh, and prior to that I was a judge advocate uh, prosecuting cases uh, in the United States Army in Europe. Uh, I was the president of the Minnesota State Bar Association from 2009 to 2010, uh, and I've uh, also been involved in um, judicial selection on the state level. Uh, the um, My practice, if you will, as a magistrate judge includes all aspects of pretrial civil and pretrial criminal, and I also have provide uh, judicial services at our non-resident courthouse in Fergus Falls. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Brisboy. Judge Lynn, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think most of you it's afternoon. To those of you who are in the morning, as I am, good morning. Um, I have been on the bench since 2000. Uh, I attended the University of Virginia and then Southern Methodist University Law School. Uh, I graduated from law school in 1976 and I joined uh, a Dallas law firm, Carrington, Coleman, Sloman and Blumenthal. I was with that firm. I started as a summer intern in 1974. I joined the firm in 1976 as an associate. Uh, became a partner, was on the management committee, uh, and worked there until I was confirmed to be a United States District Judge at the end of 1999. So I've been on the bench uh, almost 16 years. Uh, I had a very diverse practice as a trial lawyer doing uh, civil litigation as Judge Grisboy did. Uh, I have been very active uh, since I was a very young lawyer. Uh, in the American Bar Association. Uh, I became the chair of the litigation section in 1998 and after I became a judge I eventually was uh, the chair of the National Conference of Federal Trial Judges, one of our sponsors today, and then became the chair of the judicial division. So I'm an ABA junkie. Uh, I am presently on the jury commission and I've been on the standing committee on federal uh, judicial improvements. Uh, I am at the moment uh, one of the uh, chairs, and I have been for a long time, of the Judicial Intern Opportunity Program, 
uh, which is sponsored by the litigation section, and you'll hear more about that as we continue. And the last thing I want to say by uh, brief introduction to our next speaker is I had the pleasure of chairing the Bankruptcy Committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States, and one of uh, the other members of that committee was Judge Seymour, so I'm very pleased to be on a program with her. Thank you, Judge Lynn. Judge Seymour, go right ahead and introduce yourself. All right. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to serve with, um, to be here with Judge Lynn. As she indicated, we serve together on that bankruptcy committee. Um, I'm currently a senior United States District Judge for the District of South Carolina. Uh, I was appointed to the bench uh, in 1998, and before that I was served as a United States Magistrate Judge from 1996 to 1998. Um, on this district court, I've served as the chief judge for the court and also um, served uh, in various other positions on the court. Prior to assuming the bench, I served in um, the Office of the United States Attorney for the District of South Carolina. I was also the interim United States Attorney for the District of South Carolina and also the chief of the Civil Division. I've spent a number of years in private practice in South Carolina, and prior to that, I was in Washington, D.C., and I served as a senior trial attorney uh, with the Office for Civil Rights in the Department of Education. I was an attorney advisor with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and I held uh, other policy positions uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, on our the District of South Carolina is one district. We have eight full-time judges and eight senior, well, eight senior judges uh, and eight full-time judges and eight magistrate judges. And I uh, took senior status two years ago, so I have a reduced caseload of a 50% caseload. And I'm also doing both civil and criminal cases. Thank you all so much for those brief introductions. I'd like to now move on to the application process, um, kind of the start of the clerkship uh, process. Uh, and more specifically, um, do each of you prefer a specific method of delivery, whether it be mail, email, or Oscar? What, what do you look for in a resume? Um, do you need more than one writing sample? Um, talk about what maybe is has been most successful during the individual application process. Um, for people that are applying to your offices. And Judge, Judge Brisboy, if you could please start us off, that would be wonderful. All right, thank you. Um, I personally uh, use Oscar exclusively for uh, people to apply for clerkships. Uh, I interview on a yearly basis for the next year. Uh, the reason I use Oscar is, um, and the, the specifics of the system, Judge Seymour will we'll get into a little bit later, but one of the reasons I decided to use OSCAR is that uh, it allows you to set criteria, uh, and one of the criteria is a connection to Minnesota or the Midwest, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, the Dakotas, and because there are so many opportunities uh, out there for students to attend law school all over the country, obviously the school that works best for them may not be where they are connected, that being Minnesota or other Midwest states. And, but Oscar allows them to go away to the school and yet still apply for the positions with me in, in my chambers here in Duluth uh, because it's a national system and they can, uh, they'll know, they can see all the availabilities of all the people who use Oscar all over the country. And so that's why I use Oscar. Uh, to provide as big an opportunity uh, for people all over the country who might wish to practice in ultimately or relocate to Minnesota. Uh, with regard to the resume, you know, everybody's resume reflects their unique experience, uh, but the things I specifically look for, obviously academics uh, are important, um, you know, the, the results of the uh, first or second year uh, uh, law school performances, but I'm also particularly interested in um, not just law school practical experience, uh, internships, clerkships with courts or with law firms or with the U.S. Attorney's Office or Federal Defender's Office, but I'm also 
looking for uh, just their activities in general, and this can be um, extracurricular at their schools or their community activities. Uh, and I'm on a resume, one that stands out to me is, is not one with bullet points and 20, 30 lines of different activities, but I'm, I'm more in, interested in uh, resumes that give me a little bit of detail as to each of those. And I'm looking um, for those activities, both community and academic, uh, where there are leaders in those activities. They they put in time and effort, uh, and are rather than just paying the dues and and being a member. Uh, and then how that balances against their academic performance. And so, because that shows to me uh, a a good both work ethic and ability to. Uh, to manage that workload. Um, as far as writing samples, I leave that pretty much up to the applicant. They can submit one or two, uh, and if they do submit two, then they need to be two different styles uh, of writing. So I, I'll uh, end there and, and hand it off to uh, one of my colleague panelists. Judge Lynn, if you'd like to jump in here and, and kind of answer some of the questions that uh, sure. Sure, and I'll I'll try not to repeat to the extent that I agree with one of the other speakers. I think we're all looking for uh, excellent academic achievement. Um, I, as far as the the manner of receiving applications, I prefer Oscar because it cuts down on the paper load. Uh, but I accept uh, applications by mail. I don't accept them by email, but I do get applications in the mail, and when I get them, I, it, I don't throw them away. I look at them, but I don't encourage that, but it happens every year. And In fact, I hired a clerk for 2017, and I got his application by mail, sort of out of the usual season, and uh, that's when I typically get mailed in applications because people think, and they're correct, that I'm not trolling around uh, looking at Oscar in kind of the off-season. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I, I will begin with a word about writing samples. I am uh, not as interested in writing samples as others might be because, frankly, I'm somewhat skeptical about them uh, because when I get uh, an application that has a writing sample from a summer at a law firm, I know that that has been edited by the law firm. And so I'm not really seeing uh, student work. There's nothing unethical about that. I don't mean to suggest that. But it isn't necessarily, to me, a good indicator of the writing skill uh, of the applicant. So I, if I have a writing sample that I'm going to take seriously, I want to know that it is actually a student work that's only been edited by the applicant. And sometimes it's hard to get that unless it's a, uh, a law review, and even that sometimes has gone through editing. So I look at them, but I'm, I'm not wedded to them. Um, I look for many of the same things that uh, just Judge Brisbois already mentioned, so I won't repeat that. But I am uh, very interested in work experience or some kind of experience that uh, is not just going from uh, college to law school to an application, even though that, that's what I did. So uh, that, that certainly is an acceptable format. But if someone uh, has had another career or uh, has done something that is significant uh, other than just go to school and go to work, uh, that is something that I find very interesting and useful to know. Judge Seymour, you want to pick it up okay. from there? Yeah, um, I'll just pick up on that and uh, indicate that my um, my current law clerks are, cur are very m much involved in, in my whole selection process, and I take applicants applications from both Oscar and by mail, just like Judge Lynn, I do not take them by email. And I find that one writing sample is enough. I mean, and and that's sufficient. Uh, I'm also looking for participation in outside activities, and as 
uh, was indicated earlier, I want to know what your role was in, in the organization uh, that you were involved in, you know, whether or not you were a leader. Uh, I would also look at the courses that you took in law school and how challenging they were. And the most important thing to me is life experiences, uh, how you um, maybe overcame some type of challenge or how you uh, worked and went to law school at the same time or things like that uh, to make you um, show me uh, just a little bit about your personality and what kinds of activities you're involved in are things that um, I look for. I also, um, at one point, I only took clerks that had worked uh, for at least a year after law school, but now uh, I will take applications right out of law school. And um, I give a writing test uh, for the applicants. I, um, once I've gone through the, the process and narrowed them down uh, to maybe um, 10 applications, then I will do telephone interviews. And um, after that, I will select maybe five of those to give a writing test. And I do a blind writing test. And then I um, pick after I do that. So I think that that's been very helpful to me is the writing test. Because it's different from the writing sample, uh, hopefully the applicant is given a will write from the fact pattern and will it will just be there writing with no assistance. So I found that to be eye-opening. Uh, Josephine, this is Judge Lynn. I wonder if I could respond to that last comment of Judge Seymour, if yeah. you don't mind. I don't um, mind, but if you would um, just add in anything else that you might see as far as standing out um, it, for people in the application stacks within your answer. Okay, uh, that would be fine. So uh, I actually, when I uh, select people that I have decided to interview, uh, I give them a questionnaire to fill out that's pretty extensive. Uh, by, and I send that by email, and they send that back to me uh, within a day of their interview. And that gives them an opportunity to uh, write good narrative answers and I also have planted some typographical errors in it, which I invite them to correct. Uh, so that is an additional screening mechanism. I used to give a uh, proofreading test, and uh, nobody ever passed it, so I stopped giving it. Um, but uh, it's, it's very important, so I'll go to the next topic, uh, standing out in a good way and a bad way. Uh, standing out in a bad way is not to proofread your application. And uh, it's pretty amazing how many applications I get that are addressed to someone other than me. And that's not good. Uh, that has happened on occasion where it's Oscar's fault, where there's uh, a merge function, and I may get a reference letter from somebody that is addressed to a different judge than me. And if I can figure out that that's Oscar's fault, then obviously I don't hold that against the candidate. But sometimes there's a letter to me from the candidate, and it's not actually to me. And sometimes there are glaring typographical errors in a resume and in a cover letter, and that should never happen. This is one of the few uh, occasions in life where you not only need to strive for perfection, but you need to actually achieve it. Because we're getting a lot of applications, and it's very important for the judge to know that the applicants take the matter seriously, and if there are typographical errors, that indicates otherwise. So that is standing out in a bad way. Uh, standing out in a good way, to me, is trying to have some sense of the particular judge. So. I'm a little lighthearted in my approach to some things, and so there may be something on an application that is other interests that I might find interesting because somebody has done a little um, work on me, researched me, and may find something funny about me or interesting about me, and they put something on their resume that is intended to show me that they've done that. Now, it's important not to become creepy and stalking-like 
I did have someone do that one time and that stood out in a way that I felt like maybe this applicant had been driving by my house, which is not good. But if there's something that we have in common uh, and it's sincere, that's a good thing to include. And again, as I said earlier, interesting, uh, unusual work experience or commitment to the community uh, is very good. And the last thing I want to say is uh, what also makes an application stand out is a very good reference letter. And when you ask a law professor or a lawyer to write a reference letter, make sure that you are requesting that from someone who is going to be your advocate and is also a good writer. Because if I get a very good letter that doesn't sound like a form letter from someone I know well and respect or someone I don't know well and respect, that goes a long way to making an application stand out. And it also stands out, unfortunately, when I get a letter from someone who doesn't really know the applicant very well and writes something like, well, I knew uh, Joe Smith from a class of 500 people, and uh, as I recall, Joe did reasonably well in the class. That is not uh, a very good reference letter to cause an application to bubble up to the top of the pile. Thank you, Judge Lynn. Judge Seymour, if you wouldn't mind talking about standing out, um, from the stacks? I think one of the, the best ways to stand out, and I agree with Judge Lynn, is that if you have a recommendation from a professor or someone that is highly respected and it's a very good recommendation, I think that, that, that helps your application stand out. And also to indicate that you've been involved in various journals or clinics also um, is helpful in helping your application stand out. Uh, and I would also agree with her with regard to ways not to stand out, and that's not proofreading your application or making some very um, big mistakes. Um, for example, I've had people to write me and say, thank you for the interview, and I enjoyed meeting with your law clerks, and then put the wrong names for the law clerks. Uh, that's not a way to stand out. So um, I, I, I guess I'm just agreeing with Judge Lynn as, as, as ways to stand out. Thank you, Judge Seymour. And if you have anything to add, feel free, Judge Brisboy. Well, I won't repeat uh, what obviously I agree with, but let me just give a different perspective um, on one piece that no one's mentioned yet, and, and that is a cover letter. I mean, that's your first opportunity to introduce yourself to, uh, to us and um, so you want to take advantage of that opportunity. You, know, you don't want to write a 10-page brief, but on the other hand, you don't want your cover letter to be one sentence saying, enclosed, please find my application, period. Uh, that doesn't do anything to distinguish yourself from the other stack of applications. But that, that's an opportunity that I see is often missed, uh, and so I would uh, commend the uh, attendees of this webinar to uh, consider how they might take advantage of, of that opportunity to, to uh, begin to present themselves in, the, in a way that distinguishes them from the other applicants. If I could follow up on the cover letter that you just mentioned, I know when I was applying to clerkships uh, for after law school, I had a, a tough decision to make. I wanted to make a two-page cover letter and my career services opined that we were only allowed to use one pages uh, one page to have everything in there. Do you have um, any kind of comment on whether or not there is a, a page limit? I know you said 10, minute, uh, 10 pages was too much, but um, is there something that you look for, whether it be one or two or even three pages? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I, I get cover letters that are, you know, one pages from border to border and, and then others that are page and a half to two pages with, you know, um, spacing along the edges. I mean, I, I think anything beyond two pages is probably too much, but you can say quite a bit uh, in two pages, and uh, that's pertinent to what your the position you're seeking. Uh, and but it also that's um, you know along the lines of some of the comments, that's also a writing sample that I get to consider. So uh, you know the effectiveness and the efficiency of of how you communicate 
in such a tight confine says quite a bit to me. Fantastic. I'd like to start the next section off on the interview process with Judge Seymour. If you could give me a little bit of insight in how uh, you know your interview process works. I know you mentioned a little bit about what your clerks do and that you have a writing test, but if you can give a little bit more insight into what your in individual interview process is um, and how to su how best to succeed. All right. Um, my process starts with I have law clerks that go through the applica applications and, and they screen the applications based on uh, some preferences that I give them. You know, I may have a cutoff GPA and um, I'll list certain organizations that I'm looking for that I think people um, uh, that are important to me if they're in a particular organization. And um, uh, I don't limited to any geographical area, so I take law clerks from all over. So once that those applications are narrowed down, and that might be down to 100 or so, and then I get them and I read each one and pick out uh, individuals that I would like to interview based on uh, what's in the uh, resume. And I look at the grades, I look at the letters of reference. And uh, I will do a telephone interview, uh, probably do a telephone interview of 20 applications. And then after I narrow it down to about uh, five, I will um, give a writing test. And um, once the writing test comes back, we read them. I read them. My law clerks read them. And then we each rank maybe the five that took the writing test. We will rank them. And we will meet together and uh, discuss. I mean, this writing test is done blind. We don't know who the applicant is. Uh, that um, of the person, We don't know the name of the person that did the, the writing uh, until after we've reviewed them. And once we've reviewed and ranked them, then we, we reveal the names of them and we invite um, three people to come in, chambers for face-to-face -face interview if they can, and then I will make the final selection after that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Judge Brisboy, if you could talk about your interview process in Minnesota, that'd be wonderful. All right. Um, well, we get, uh, when people heard I'm from Duluth, Minnesota, they must figure I get three applications a year. So. Um, but that, in fact, is not the case. Uh, we we get anywhere between 100 and 150 applications a year for uh, for our vacancy, and so we have as much of a daunting task to, as as my colleagues on the call to uh, decide who it is we want to meet in person. And so we also do a uh, paper screen. Uh, we get it down to about 35 uh, of potential candidates and then I go through each of them again privately on my own, entirely on my own, uh, and I identify uh, the 10 uh, that I want to meet with personally and we extend invitations uh, for in-person interviews. Each interview lasts about an hour if they accept the invitation. Uh, the reason I extend so many invitations is uh, I find that out of that 10, uh, three, uh, you know, three to four will self-select out, uh, which tells me something about their commitment to actually clerking for the District of Minnesota, and more particularly here in Duluth. Uh, the people who have not self-selected out, then um, we arrange for the personal interview here in Duluth, uh, and my law clerks participate in that interview, uh, not because they have the final say, but because we are a chambers away from the main body of our court. Uh, obviously, we're a very small working family, and and so we, I, their input uh, is very important. Uh, we all because there will be um, some overlap with the new clerk and and the uh, junior clerk, and so uh, their how they react to the people is going to be very important to me to consider. Um, the as I said, the interview lasts about an hour. Uh, I don't do a separate uh, writing test, uh, but I uh, perhaps one thing that I do that others don't is um, 
I ask them the last question first, and I'm probably giving away the, the secret here, but uh, I ask them to uh, close out the interview by telling me something about themselves that uh, is entirely outside the box or a non sequitur with regard to uh, uh, what we would assume and what our career counseling offices tell us uh, would be something pertinent to an application for judicial clerkship. Uh, that's entirely up to them as to what they want to tell me, but uh, the point of it is something that is not included in the written materials, not included in their professional and educational bios, but yet still demonstrates uh, character traits or personal skill sets or, or some other personal quality that would translate to success in the uh, hard work environment that clerkship does require. Uh, and that sometimes, you know, uh, how people react to that question uh, also is very telling uh, in terms of, um, you know, creativity, on-the-spot responses, uh, kind of things that happen all the time in the judicial and, and litigation settings. Thank you so much. Judge Lynn, do you have anything to add about the interview process? Well, just to say that uh, I interview the candidate for about 45 minutes. Um, my clerk screen, as the other judges uh, mentioned, and then um, I select a number of people that I invite to come. I only have one spot available now because I have uh, a permanent law clerk uh, effective this year, so I'm only interviewing one person for uh, a position every year to the extent I have an opening that I haven't already filled. Uh, and then my uh, staff also interviews the candidates, not just my law clerks, but my staff, uh, because it's in my view, very important uh, for everyone to get along. This is a close working environment, and I want to make sure my staff is comfortable with the candidates uh, as well. Uh, I do have people fill out that form, and I go over that. It's very important that that be uh, accurate and complete, and I think I learn a little bit more about the candidate than I would know uh, from the resume before they come in so that I don't have to start uh, from scratch. Um, I don't give, as I said, a writing test in addition to that, but obviously I'm very uh, interested in the quality of the writing uh, that I see, not only in the cover letter, as Judge Brisboy mentioned, in the resume itself, but in the questionnaire that I have uh, for them to fill out. Thank you so much, Judge Lynn. You all have talked a lot about it about things to, to do well and also to avoid. I'm just wondering if you have any other application or interview pitfalls to avoid, um, starting off with Judge Brisboy. Well, um, this is kind of a universal, but I, it's uh, every year that I interview, I find there's at least one or two people that have not uh, thought about this. Uh, no what the job is that you're applying for. And um, let me just make it specific to Duluth here. Uh, every district, the 94 districts, utilize their magistrate judge's bench differently. And so if you come to the interview with just a general uh, understanding or, or think you have an understanding of what the magistrate judges do, uh, you're not going to know what they do in this district, and of course that's going to be important to me. Um, so I would say the number one pitfall is, uh, you know, depending on on the judge that you're applying for, is understand uh, truly understand the nature of that job, the nature of the caseload, uh, and you know before you get there because the judge or I'm going to be looking for that. I'm sure other judges will be looking for that. And, but that also helps you prepare for the interview because you'll be able to have some prior, give this some prior thought to how uh, your academics, your practical experience in law school, your practical experience outside of law school uh, translates to meeting those needs and challenges. Thank you, Judge Brisboy. Judge Lane, do you have any pitfalls to add? Well, I, I mentioned uh, being very careful about the quality of the writing. And if you are coming to a district 
where you have no apparent connection, you need to be prepared to explain why you want to come there. I mean, the judge is having to screen among other candidates, and I personally, I don't require that my clerks stay here in Texas after they clerk for me, and many have gone elsewhere to work, but I like to have the possibility that they will stay in my community. So I'm looking for some connection or particular interest in our community, and sometimes people have no explanation, and that makes me think they're not likely to stay, and if I know that going in, that is not a positive. And it's important to have an interesting conversation. Um, I don't want to be checking my watch five minutes in and feeling like time has stood still. Um, you really should be engaging and have an interesting, informed conversation that you've worked hard to prepare for. Thank you, Judge Lynn. Judge Seymour, do you have any pitfalls to add? I don't really have anything new to add, and I, I would just emphasize that the, the, the proofreading is so, so important because I think this reflect, reflects on the bigger issue, and that is an indication of whether or not you pay attention to detail, which is so important for a clerk. And um, I think it's so important that, you know, uh, one of the qualities that, you know, a clerk has is intellectual honesty and that you're prepared to talk about you know, ethical issues that maybe you've uh, encountered and uh, be prepared to address those when you come in for an interview. Thank you, Judge Seymour. Before we move on to the next topic, I'd just like to remind you all that you do have the ability to submit questions that can be answered later. Hopefully there, are, there is time remaining. Um, Austin has posted in the chat on how exactly to do that. Um, as we move into the next uh, section, now you have achieved a clerkship, the coveted position. Um, what specifically do you recommend some law students do in preparation of a clerkship? Whether it be taking a class in law school, for example, my judge recommended that we take federal courts, um, and he also gave us a writing guide on how to write judicial opinions for him. Um, so starting with Judge Lynn, do you have any uh, recommendations on um, what a law student should do to prepare for the clerkship? Well, I think it's very important to know what the docket is like of the judge for whom you will be clerking. Uh, I'm a patent pilot judge, so I have a pretty healthy caseload of patent cases, uh, and that is a hard subject to teach oneself. So I always encourage my clerks, after they've accepted uh, a job with me, before they start to take a basic patent course so they can understand the lingo. Uh, I think uh, federal courts, procedure, evidence, the basic courses for uh, practicing and understanding practice in federal court, of course, are necessary. I think it's a good idea to at least come down and watch some proceedings in court so you know what to expect. And I have a clerk manual. Uh, every year it gets revised with things that happen that we haven't already covered. Um, and my clerks have to study that before they get here. It's the Bible and it teaches them a whole lot. So that those are the quick and easy things to do to get ready. Thank you, Judge Lynn. Judge Seymour, can you discuss some of your preparations? Well, I think it's important. I don't know that any particular class is necessary, but um, I'm a stickler for writing, so any course that requires you to do some type of analysis and writing would be very helpful. And I think it's important that a clerk um, read some of the opinions of the judge that you're going to clerk for just to get a feel for th that judge's writing style. I think that's very important. Thank you, Judge Seymour. And Judge Brisboy, can you discuss some of your preparations? What I recommend uh, once uh, a clerk has accepted an offer of employment is uh, much of which has already been referred to, but first uh, read prior orders and reports and recommendations uh, so that you before you get there uh, so that you know what the expectations are in terms of what a final work product might look like. Uh, with regard to the nature of the work that a law clerk does for me as a magistrate judge in this district, obviously um, 
civil procedure, federal civil procedure, uh, federal criminal procedure, uh, but also social security, habeas corpus. Um, I mean, those are things that we do on a regular basis uh, in this district, and I'll point that out to them. And so to the extent, I'm not saying they need to change their course schedule to do those things, but they're going to want to be uh, look into those areas, do some reading in those areas, uh, horn books, other things, just so they have some background before they get here, or it's going to be quite a shock. Thank you. I know that we have a little bit less than 20 minutes left, so I want to make sure we get to all of the wonderful information we still have. But if possible, could each of you choose one quality of a successful clerk that you've had, um, kind of a recurring quality that each of your clerks have had that have been successful, um, beginning with Judge Seymour? I think intellectual honesty is very important to me and self-motivation, if I'm limited. Uh, to what qualities I'm looking for. Fantastic. Judge Brisboy? Well, I would, uh, obviously that's important, work ethic, uh, but also curiosity. I mean, the, the intellectual curiosity is as important as intellectual honesty because uh, you have to be willing to sometimes look outside the box that's been presented to you by the parties because they may not have it right themselves and you don't want to just be led down the path by them. Uh, you got to be willing to look at other options. So uh, intellectual curiosity would be important and has been a trait of successful clerks here in my chambers. Thank you. And finally, Judge Lynn? Well, it's hard to limit that to one thing, but I will. And I would say the ability to juggle. Uh, there, You have to be able to come from a very uh, difficult, long, project to a quick matter, you have to uh, be prepared to be interrupted by a temporary restraining order that walks in the door, and you have to be prepared for the judge coming in your office just to chat when you really don't have the time or the inclination to do it. So it's just a lot of moving targets all the time, and the clerk has to be prepared to move from one thing to the other. Uh, and keep focus on what needs to be done and not drop the ball. Thank you all so much for your invaluable insight. We're now going to talk about some specific clerkship and internship opportunities, including the online system for clerkship application review, also known as OSCAR, the ABA Judicial Clerkship Program, and finally the ABA Section of Litigation's Judicial Intern Opportunity Program, JIOP. Judge Seymour, can you start us off with a little bit of discussion about OSCAR? All right, sure. OSCAR is, like you said, the online system for clerkship applications and review. And this system uh, was created to give federal judges a way to communicate to law students their hiring practices and the timelines that they have. Um, this system, OSCAR, allows uh, judges to get law clerks who are good fits for them and also um, gives the student um, a level playing field because all of the students have the same information. They know what the judges are looking for, what their their timelines are, and any preferences that they might have. Uh, prior to this Oscar system, students may have heard about a clerkship position by word of mouth or by contacting a judge's chambers, and so they rarely knew what um, uh, a judge wanted in a law clerk. Uh, under the OSCAR system, judges will post uh, descriptions on OSCAR uh, of what they're looking for in a law clerk. Uh, they, you know, for example, a judge could indicate what courses they're looking for, uh, what bar memberships, if any, they require, if they have a cutoff class rank, uh, prior work experiences, and, and any professional organizations that they are uh, would give um, our interest to the particular judge. And the Oscar system allows the judges to electronically sort uh, the applications and by doing that they can focus on those applications that meet their particular criteria. And it also has been students because it makes it easier for students to find judges that they would like to apply to and uh, 
areas that they want to apply to and judges who may have a background or interest that they also have an interest in. And once the application process uh, is, is completed, um, the judges then can look at the letters of reference that the, that the student put on and then uh, use, use the, the electronic system to look at applications rather than getting boxes and boxes and boxes of application. Um, also under OSCAR, the applicants can review the, the different profiles of the judges and um, determine you know, which judges have open positions and which judges do not so that you don't send an application to a judge that doesn't have an opening. And recently, OSCAR now allows the applicants to update their documents. That is, you can report uh, new grades, you can report uh, class rank updates, and any new awards or recommendations and other information, uh, you, you can do that now. Also under OSCAR, you can see a judge's preferred interview methods, whether a judge does interviews by telephone or video conference, or whether or not the judge has uh, any preference at all. Um, so the benefit of OSCAR is that it lets the judges sort through and rank applications that are of most interest to them, and it also allows students to be have information all of the students have the same information and apply to judges that they're also interested in. As of now, I think there's 73 percent of all the federal judges have uh, an Oscar profile. And uh, rising second year law students can register for an Oscar account uh, on June 1, and rising 2Ls can submit online applications uh, for available law clerk positions. Third year law students and law school graduates can register for an OSCAR account anytime and submit online applications. And I, there's a limit of 100 finalized applications uh, to law clerk positions of any term length. So that is the cutoff. And so I think it's a system that makes the whole process a little easier for everyone. Thank you, Judge Seymour. Judge Brisboy, can you tell us about the ABA Judicial Clerkship Program? Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, the, for our attendees right now, the, they're how do we do it? But a great many of them may be wondering uh, if I'm even interested in a clerkship. And so the ABA Judicial Clerkship Program gives you an opportunity to uh, explore that, see what being a law clerk is like, uh, and whether it's something that you would either aspire to or want to make part of your professional career after law school. Uh, the program is in its 16th year uh, come this February at the mid-year meeting at the ABA. Uh, it's held in conjunction with the ABA mid-year meeting. This year that's in San Diego, California. Uh, we have the program uh, is one that's open to law schools who wish to send uh, a group of students uh, to the program, they, law schools uh, will select who the attendees are going to be. Uh, usually, if a school participates, it's based on student uh, communication with their administration and desire to have them be a participant in the judicial clerkship program. Um, the typical size of a Law school delegation uh, is five to ten students. Usually, six to seven is about average. Uh, and um, the uh, the schools uh, will there's a fee which the administration would pay. Uh, and in the past, it's been a three-year commitment to the JCP. But this year, uh, given the economics that law schools are are facing. Uh, Schools can commit to a one-year participation to see if it's a program that they want to make a regular part of, of the services available to their student body. Uh, the, we have room for uh, 75 to 100 participating law students. And the way the program works is uh, over the course of two and a half days, uh, they will be paired in small groups with two to three uh, judges, uh, state court judges, state court trial judges, state appellate judges, uh, federal 
trial judges. Uh, we have federal appellate judges participating. Um, we have uh, also are exposed to uh, other kinds of courts. We have ad administrative court judges participate, and we have international court judges participating uh, because they all use law clerks uh, in in different ways. And so it's an opportunity to not only find out if you want to be a law clerk, but also to find out the variety of the types of law clerks and the areas of law where they're utilized, which might better fit with your personal um, uh, interests. Now, during the two and a half days, the way you interface with those volunteer judges is um, part of it is a resume critique, uh, just mentoring, answering questions, but also there is a uh, a writing project. Uh, you get you get a fact pattern, uh, and you work with the judge uh, to develop uh, analyses and drafts of an order or opinion. Uh, and the problems are interesting and unique because they are based on cases that are currently pending before the United States Supreme Court and don't have a clear-cut answer. And so the research that's done during the two and a half days to come up with the writing that the students do uh, is, is challenging and interesting and unique. Uh, it's sponsored by LexisNexis, so you have full access to uh, online computer research. Uh, and then during the time, uh, there are also other opportunities to meet and socialize and network with the volunteer judges, other members of the judicial division. Uh, there's, a, there's a field trip to see uh, actual oral arguments in a local court uh, and talk to their clerks as to how the things are going on, on the ground for them and their positions. Uh, the, um, and a number, I can tell you that a great many of the attendees uh, will make relationships with some of the judges, volunteer judges, that have in the past led to internships and in, in many cases to clerkships uh, after law school. The typical student who attends the JCP is usually a 1L or a 2L. Uh, because they're, as I said, they're using the opportunity to see uh, if clerkship is something that they're interested in and then get the insights of judges, volunteer judges, as to how they can use their remaining time in law school to best position themselves to pursue and, and achieve that goal of a clerkship. Uh, if the people attending this, con this webinar are interested in uh, attending the judicial clerkship in San Diego this coming February, uh, you should approach your school's administration, uh, explain the ABA Judicial Clerkship Program. There's information on the ABA's website, uh, but more specific inquiries and information can be directed to uh, ABA staff person who's in charge uh, of uh, registration. Her name is Sharon Tindall, S-H-A-R-O-N-T-I-N-D-A-L-L. -L. Her phone number is 312. 988-5642. Her email is capital S H A R O N dot capital T I N D A L L at American Bar dot org. Uh, we are currently accepting applications. The registration deadline is will be is actually going to be extended uh, well into December, so there's plenty of time uh, for you students to approach your administrations uh, if you have an interest in the program and, and have them inquire as to uh, participating for this coming year uh, in San Diego. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Brisboy. Judge Lynn, can you quickly tell us about the ABA Section of Litigation Judicial Internship Opportunity Program? Yes, I'll make this brief so we'll have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, this program is called the JIOP Program. Uh, an acronym for the title of the program. Uh, its purpose is to provide internship opportunities uh, that come with compensation uh, for the summer. Uh, some students work for credit, uh, some work for compensation. Uh, the compensation is paid uh, through the American Bar Association for uh, to the litigation section for a minimum of uh, six weeks. It provides opportunities to students who are in traditionally underrepresented groups racially or ethnically, uh, students who have disabilities or economically disadvantaged, 
uh, who are LGBT students and also veterans. Uh, it's a full-time uh, summer internship program. It works at various times during the summer. Uh, the applications are screened and then given to judges who make their decisions about hiring. Uh, we hire both first and second year students in the cities that are listed on the screen that you see and also in Washington, D.C. Uh, the application deadline is January the 4th. Um, we sometimes have extended that for people who participate in the program that Judge Brisboy just described at the ABA mid-year meeting, which is in February. But if you're interested, you should assume this is a, a solid date of January 4th and get your application in. You can access the program by just uh, Googling the JIOP program and it'll bring it up, but you also have the email address on the screen. Thank you very much, Judge Lynn. We have received three questions in advance that you all have so wonderfully already answered. One was whether or not students from smaller out-of-state schools will be considered, and we've heard from Judge Brisboy that yes, they are, and also from Judge Lynn that you just need to explain why you're interested in moving to a new location. Um, we also heard whether or not prior work experience is considered, both from Judge Seymour and Judge Lynn, that yes, it is. Sometimes it's uh, focused on by certain judges more closely than others. And finally, should a student who seeks a clerkship have a writing certificate? And while it may not necessarily be necessary, um, it is something that is highly considered and extremely important to judges. Um, the writing samples, um, whether or not their cover letters have been proofread, and also the importance of a great recommendation letter during the process. Um, those seem to be all of the questions that I am seeing. Josephine, uh, uh, this is Judge Lynn. If, if we have just a second, I would love to add one more thing, if I may. Absolutely. And, and that is the importance of an internship. Uh, and that flows nicely from my very abbreviated discussion about the Judicial Intern Opportunity Program. Um, I take interns every summer and my hiring standard for summer interns is a little bit lighter academically than it is for clerks. I don't hire my summer interns as clerks. I've made them all ineligible. So someone who really wants to clerk for me should not intern for me. Uh, but it gives uh, a pretty good experience in my judgment that is a very helpful credential to apply for a clerkship elsewhere. And I've had plenty of my interns who have gotten clerkships where I think their academic achievement might have been a little light, but they got uh, a better evaluation from judges who were considering their application because they had that internship experience. So uh, I just want to say that whether through the JIA program or otherwise, uh, it's a very good thing to try to do uh, either during the year, part-time while you're in school, or during the summer. And let me just say that I agree with Judge Lynn that um, I take interns every year and they are voluntary, they're not paid, but and that shows a commitment to uh, learning the process of what the judicial system is all about. And I don't hire my interns, but I have hired interns from other judges. So. Thank you both for that. Um, I actually interned my after my first year in Kansas City in federal district court, um, and I'm not on the law review or moot court at my school, but was still able to land uh, a federal clerkship in Philadelphia after law school, and I take part of that to great non-formed uh, recommendation letters, but also to my internship experience that summer in Kansas City. Um, with that, I'd like to thank our faculty for this program, uh, Judge Brisboy, Judge Lynn, and Judge Seymour. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. On behalf of the ABA, I'm Josephine Bond thanking you all for joining us. As a reminder, ABA membership is now free for all law students. With no worries about dues, now all law students can access the ABA's resources, build networks, and develop their profession their professional outlook. Uh, please visit our website for more information.
Finally, before you leave, please wait for the evaluation to come up on your screen. Thank you all so much for attending the program.